everyone for, for coming. I'm just going to do a couple announcements before our, we get started with the presentation. Uh, just again, welcome to uh, Club E St. Paul. Um, if we have not met, my name is Chum Struby. I host this event um, at luncheon every third Wednesday. Uh, we do have a, a couple locations, and I want to tell you about the upcoming events uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, Rick is the host. If you haven't been out to his fabulous event, he's the founder um, and, uh, and helped me start the St. Paul location. He has November 28th in Minneapolis at the Minneapolis Club Lessons Learned, Best Advice, best practices then no, december 7th he has uh, if you can't beat them join them that sounds good and uh, back here we have december 13th which is moved up one week due to the holiday the second wednesday of the month is momentum matters with mark leblanc um, I want to give a big thank you to the sponsors that we have who help us bring this luncheon to you that's the university club Olsen Thiel and CPAs, Mike, the loud mouth over there, uh, is a regional, yes, a regional accounting and consulting firm, Schwegman, Lungberg, and Wussner, an IP attorneys for tech companies, the Irish Titan, an e-commerce digital agency, Sunbelt Business Brokers of Minnesota, helping you buy and sell your business, and my company, Legal Shield, providing identity theft and legal protection to consumers and small businesses. Um, a little bit about our speaker. She is the founder of Nine Open Doors and specializing, specializes in using the Enneagram to create intriguing team building scenarios and improve leadership. She has worked with teams at Ecolab, Best Buy, Anytime Fitness, and numerous universities and nonprofits. A dynamic and authentic international speaker. She is skilled at engaging with groups in a variety of ways, from presenting a keynote at conferences to leading highly personalized staff retreats. A graduate of St. Olaf College, Kate worked in the fundraising, communications, and marketing world for 16 years. She has studied the Enneagram with many of the leading teachers in the country and is a member of the Enneagram and Business Network. She is a former board member of the Minnesota chapter of the International Enneagram Association. Please give a hand and a welcome to our speaker, Kate Ostrom. All right. So we're going to start right away with an activity at your table. And you'll see in the middle of your table, there's two handouts. Take the one that's not colorful, the top one. The other one is for later. It just has a few questions with some boxes on it. Somebody be nice and pass those around. I put a few pens at each table if you didn't think to bring one. So today we're going to talk a little bit about strengths and weaknesses and their connection between them and how understanding your weaknesses especially can help improve your business. The tool I use to help you understand this is called the Enneagram. This is what it looks like. It's weird looking, right? We can all acknowledge that. It is not about devil worship. <laughs> but it's interesting just to understand that the word Enneagram in Greek means nine-sided figure. Pentagram means five-sided figure, right? That's all it means. So don't let the symbol spook you. It's just a symbol. It means nine-sided figure. And we're going to get to that a little later. Um, but I'm curious, with a show of hands, who has heard of the Enneagram before? Rick, I know you have. OK. And Anne, you have. We talked about Or Beth, I'm sorry. We talked about that a little bit. And OK, yeah, great. Oh, good. A long time ago? OK, well, that's all right. That's all right. Good. So this is fun to have a smattering of people who've heard of it but a lot of people who have never heard of it before, right? I would say the majority of you, like, what is this thing? So that's really fun, too. I love having kind of that fresh um, perspective on this. OK, before we talk about what the Enneagram really is, I want us to go through this activity, which I think is really an eye-opener. You've got two columns there, one for work and one for home. And I'd like you to focus on the work one right now. And I'd like you to answer these questions. First, um, jot some notes about them on your own, and then I want you to discuss them with the person sitting next to you at your table. 
So answer these three questions. The first one is, what is one of your strengths? And don't spend a lot of time on that. Just whatever comes to the top of your head. Or if you were uh, uh, in a job interview, what would you say? The second question is even easier. What is the opposite of that strength? And you don't have to impress us with your vocabulary here. You can just negate whatever the strength is, even if you're kind of making up a new word. The third question is where you're going to want to spend a little more time. That is, how could the opposite also be considered a strength? So I'm going to give you an example. I am very friendly. That's one of my strengths. I've known that since I was a little kid. I've been told it a million times. It's just something I really um, own um, and know is true about myself. So that's how I answered the first time I ever did this. That was my answer to question number one. So the opposite, unfriendly, right? That's easy. Now, the third question was tricky for me the first time I thought through this. How is being unfriendly a strength? I was working with an Enneagram coach one-on-one -on -one at the time when we were going through this, and it re I really got stumped <clears throat> because at the time, I really felt like people who were unfriendly were just the worst. <laughs> Really, I mean, I just thought they were rude and cold, and they made me feel like I'd done something wrong. And I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I always thought, like, well, wouldn't it just be more pleasant for all of us if we were friendly? Through working with this coach, as good coaches do, she kind of prodded me on that and helped me understand all the ways that being friendly gets me into trouble. All right? And there's a long, long list, but I'll just share a few. <laughs> They range from being late to pick up my kids because I'm chit-chatting with the Target cashier, okay, to not portraying an authentic version of myself when I'm having a crummy day because I'm too busy being friendly or too used to being friendly, really. It's my habit. It's my habit. Is that inaccurate portrayal of how I'm feeling, is that fair to other people that I'm meeting? Is it fair to myself? that I'm not letting people see that side of me. I'm not letting people in. OK, so there can be like kind of silly little things that happen when we overuse the strength. Um, and there can be quite serious things. So I've learned that people who are unfriendly are really good at guarding their energy, their time. They create boundaries that they really hold sacrosanct, right? Like they're really important, these boundaries. And there's a lot of good that comes out of that. At the time, I was working with a woman who I found very unfriendly. And I started looking at her differently because I realized like, she always got her work done. And people kind of left her alone. You know, so she was never interrupted when she didn't want to be. She was never like dragged into office intrigue. She wasn't confided in, which allowed her to just kind of stay on the periphery and get her own thing done. And she loved that. And I realized, like, okay, I could learn a lot from that. That's really a strength. So go through this for yourself. Think about the work sphere. What's a strength for you when it comes to work? What's the opposite of that? And how could the opposite also be a strength when it comes to work? And I'm sorry, but nobody can use friendly as their example, even though I'm sure there are friendly people here. We're in Minnesota. Everyone is more friendly. Right, right, yeah. We're sure they're authentic. <laughs> so go through just quickly, think through some ideas there, and then talk to your neighbor. If you have a hard time answering that third question, your neighbor will be able to help you. And then I'll ask for some brave volunteers.
plus. A plus. Oh yeah, I know all about you, Stephen. <laughs> no, no, I try not to do that. But it is an occupational hazard. Yeah. <laughs> Time to share. So, a couple more minutes. conversation. I hate having to do that, but we've got a lot to cover. So could I ask for a few volunteers? Anybody willing to share how they answered these three questions? Maybe especially if you had a hard time answering that third question, because then you could get some input from the larger group. So. All right, my, my strength is that I can do anything. The okay. That's not a strength is that I do everything. Yep. Okay. Let's come back, please. Thank you. What? I'm just having a hard time hearing. Okay. So, and go ahead. The solution is this, I need to delegate. So, it's a very simple problem and solution. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, let's just go over that. So, this, your strength is that you can do anything. Yeah. And the opposite of, of that. Okay. So, what the opposite of doing everything is doing nothing. Okay, okay, all right. I might ask somebody to volunteer who kind of stuck to my three. Just uh, if there are any rule followers here. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> Would anybody else be willing to volunteer? Thank you, Justin. I'm going to give you this. These are what the brave volunteers get. This is a tool that I use with all my clients that explains the Enneagram in more depth. So now we're going to have hands raised because you want the cool thing. Yeah. <laughs> David. <laughs> so I said strength was efficiency. Efficiency, yep. And the opposite of that is inefficiency. Very nice. Nice job and negating nice. that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and how would the opposite also of strength? Well, that did get me thinking because I thought, uh, yeah. in addition, it sounds really bad. Right. Could be helpful at times. We'll say that. Could be helpful at times. Could you hear that over here? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, it's an it's a interesting thing to think about, isn't it? The other thing with inefficiency is perhaps there are times when it would benefit us to take a long time yeah. with something and not just check it off the list and move on. You yeah. know, perhaps. Great, thank you. There are those, yeah. Who else would volunteer? Yeah, Angie? Right. Yeah. Counterbalance yep. your strengths. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, really smart. Great. Thank you very much. Those are for you. Anybody from this table willing to volunteer? Yeah. Diana? Yeah. Great. Uh, so organizations are bringing groups or ideas together and bring those groups together. Okay. Talk a little louder just so that far table can hear you. Uh, the opposite <laughs> of being unorganized mm -hmm. um, and a chaos and scatteredness, but I think... Does it give you like a little... It does. We were talking about... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, this is... <laughs> Right. And sometimes I think when I've worked with folks who are really organized, are that type, you know, where all the ducks are in a row, sometimes what that can happen, especially in a team setting, is it prevents other people from being able to take charge a little bit um, or be heard. Yeah. So, yes, great. Thank you very much, Diana. Okay, who from the back table is going to share? It's got to be somebody back here. <laughs> Beth? All right. Communicating through writing. The opposite of talking. Uh-huh. Oh, and here you are. Put on the spot by your colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so how <laughs> I'm sorry, you do we've got to just answer that last question. Two thirds of the way done. There are times where maybe putting things into verbally mm -hmm. would be more beneficial than yeah. written, like when you're on the spot and you have to talk in front of a group, yeah. right? Not my strength, but I could do you it. did great. You did great. Thank you. That's for that. <laughs> so there's a fourth question on there for you that you can answer in your own time, and that is, you know, what's a step that you could do today to change this a little bit? And what I mean by that is. And actually, I could just answer that question for all of you, which is this. Just notice that you do this, okay? Notice that you have this strength, and notice how you overuse it. I really believe that strengths and weaknesses are two sides of the same coin. I think we're often taught, you know, here are your strengths, here's your list of eight qualities, whatever it is, six qualities. Here's what you're really good at. Do more of that all the time, forever and ever, to everybody you ever meet. Just do, focus on those. Do that more. Well, the thing is, is that we're already doing that. We just naturally do what we're good at, right? We're drawn to jobs where those, the skills they need beat the skills that we have. Um, we want to do things that we're, are our strengths because that feels good. It's where we just naturally fit. What I think is really helpful is to start to identify this tipping point where overusing our strengths becomes our weakness. What does that look like? So, you know, in David's case, his example of inefficiency serves him super well. I mean, it really, really does. But there are times where it might be too much and it might not be the right choice or the most helpful 
choice. So just start to notice that about yourself. Where is your strength getting you into trouble? Okay? I often, so with my friendliness issue, I will often make a conscious decision. I'm just going to be quiet for a couple of hours. Like if I'm running errands or something, I'm going to, I might even put in my little earbuds, be one of those people, you know, and just do my own thing and see how that feels. And you know what? It can feel kind of good. It can feel kind of good. So I would just challenge you just to notice where does your strength get in trouble? What does that look like? And how can you make some little tweaks? How can you make some adjustments? Especially, here's an intriguing idea. We've got Thanksgiving coming up next week. I have a whole column there for you to think about this in terms of home life, family life, friend life. Who is the person that you get into the same flippin' conversation with over and over and over and you have the same outcome? You all have a face in your mind right now. I guarantee it, at least one. I have one. What could you do to approach that differently? You're not going to change that other person. But what could you do yourself? How is it tied to your, how's your reaction tied to your strengths? And how could you think about that a little differently? Okay, so that's a little homework for you. But now, let's chat more about the Enneagram. And so you can, oh, it moved just as I was taking it out of my pocket. That was like perfect. <laughs> um, you can take the other hand out on your table. It's got the, the symbol of it on the top. There you go. So the Enneagram is a personality tool that helps us understand the motivation behind our behavior. Now, everybody in this room, I'm sure, has taken Myers-Briggs at some time, maybe more than once. I've taken it a number of times throughout my life. Insights is really popular, Strengths Finder. There are so many personality systems that are really well known and really, really useful. I believe in all of those. Those systems are looking at our behaviors and our preferences. Okay, that's what they're, they're telling us about, um, which really is helpful to know. The Enneagram is looking at a deeper layer of who we are, and that is the motivation behind our behaviors. Why? Why are those our behaviors? Why are those our preferences? Now, because the Enneagram is about this deeper layer of who we are, there is no accurate test that's been created. If you leave today and you think, this is super cool, I want to get all into the Enneagram, and you Google Enneagram tests, you will find some, and they do exist, but they're only about 50% accurate. So just know that, should you, should you choose to take one, which there's no reason not to, but just know that the answer will not necessarily be true. And that's because no one has figured out how to accurately test for our motivation. What series of questions could we ask to really get at that? So instead, deciding which of these nine types you are is up to you. And you get to go on a journey of self-discovery, should you choose to accept this invitation, and you figure it out on your own, or with a guide like me, or with the help of, there's a ton of great books. I've listed some on my website. And you get to figure it out. Now, some of you right now might be like, oh, why would I ever want to do that? Like, can't you just tell me? Can't I answer like 12 questions and get the answer? And that's, you know, it's a valid viewpoint. And it probably says something about your Enneagram type, really. And some of you might think like, ooh, this sounds fun. You know, I want to dig into this. Who was I talking to? Beth Ann, you were saying that. Yeah, you're like, oh, I love this stuff. I love this stuff. But the fact of the matter is, is that most of us have just not been taught how to think of ourselves in this way, how to really understand our motivation. And I'm not talking about motivation like I want to make money or I want to um, be a CEO. It's not that kind of motivation. It's a more intrinsic um, driver within us, and it's all around something that we have forgotten as a child. Okay, and I'll talk about that a little bit as we go through the nine types. So that's a little bit about how the Enneagram is different from other personality systems. They can complement each other. Like I work with teams and workplaces who've used you know, Myers-Briggs and then they bring me in to do the Enneagram and they can fit nicely like side by side because people can just end up learning even more about each other and themselves. But there is no direct correlation. Like if you're an INTJ, you're not going to be a certain type on the Enneagram. And that's because it's like apples and oranges. They're both fruit but they're different fruits. 
So they're looking at different things. So what I'd like to do is just give you a little teaser of the nine different types. This is very, very preliminary. I was telling a couple of folks that typically I do like an introductory workshop on the Enneagram will be about three hours long because it's quite an intensive system. So this is just a little teaser just to introduce it to you. And so this handout just kind of gives some high level information about each type. What I want to do is as we go through them, I'm going to talk about the strengths of the type and I would like somebody here just to shout out, you don't have to raise your hand, what does it look like when that type overuses their strength? Okay, so what's the opposite? What's it, how does their strength get them into trouble? Just the exercise that we just did all together. All right? So let's get started. We'll start with type one. Um, some Enneagram teachers, if you have any books on this or look into it, they'll use different titles for the different types. Uh, the one might be the judge or the teacher. I avoid that. I like to use the numbers just because I feel like it's a more neutral thing. You know, language is really loaded. Um, but sometimes those, those words can also help you get a feel for the type. Um, so just know that should you look into it more. Okay, so ones are people in our life who have a really strong sense of what is right and what is wrong. They're very ethically minded. And they're a great person to go to if you are making a really difficult decision about something because they can break it down into black and white and they can do like the pros and cons list. You know, here are all the reasons you should. Here are all the reasons you shouldn't. And one of the great things about ones is that they can come into any situation and improve it immediately. They can see how this would be better. You know, like if they came into this room, maybe they'd say like, well, we really should have made sure that people sat at this table because it's kind of weird having a table up front that's totally empty. Okay? They'll just have these ideas. They'll just come to them immediately. They're all about making things better and improvement. So that all serves ones really, really well. It's pretty obvious how, I think. But how could that be overused? Justin. They will uh, help people improve even when they don't want help. Yes, that is true. Does everybody want to be told how to do something better? But they should be. Probably not. Probably not. I worked with a client early on in my business who uh, oversees a huge, huge conference. And her team takes care of it every year. And it, she gets rave reviews. I mean, this thing is a, an enormous success. And she can't hear them. She can't accept that praise because she's been making a long list, a literal list, written down on all the things that did not go well and what she needs to change for the next year. So the work that we did together was about hearing the praise, really feeling the praise, taking a moment just to bask in a job well done. So that's the one. And now I was telling you about this motivation being tied to something that we forget as children. And what ones have forgotten is that they are good. Okay? What this means is that when we bring on our Enneagram type, that happens around the time we're five or six, and it's inevitable. It's nobody's fault. It's not our parents' fault. Um, it has to happen because it helps us to survive and thrive in the world. I mean, if you imagine that we are all living today as four-year-olds, you know, it would be a little chaotic, a little crazy. So we have to bring on our type because it helps us survive and thrive into the world. But when we bring it on, we bring it on in response to something that we forget. It's something that's true. All these things that the types have forgotten are true, but each type has forgotten something differently. And once have forgotten that they're good, and that's why they're so fixated on what is bad and what is good, what is right and what is wrong. There's a great irony in each of these things that we have forgotten because when you know ones, they are so good. They are so good. It's because they have forgotten. Okay. And there's more information about that on the folks who got the cards. Okay, number two, type two. Twos are people in the world who are just really natural nurturers super caring, and very in tune to other people's needs. I mean, they might be, like, might meet you, Beth, and be like, gosh, you know, you just seem a little down. Like, do you need, can I take you out for coffee and just hear what's going on? Like, they're just, and you might think, oh my gosh, I am kind of down. Like, I didn't even realize that. I mean, just very, very intuitive. I have a good friend who's a two who has told me things about myself, and once she said them, I'm like, well, that's obvious, but I had never realized it before. Twos tend to be very social, 
um, might be like the ultimate host. You know, love to have people over or make sure that people know each other, are comfortable, very much tuned into other people's needs. So how could that go wrong? They don't take care of themselves. That's right. They are, they're, I was going to say on the bottom of the list, but they're not even on the list. They're not even on the list. And twos have a lot of energy, but it's all oriented to other people. Uh, my friend who is a two, who knows the Enneagram very, very, very well, she can uh, describe, she's in her 80s, and she can tell me times she's been sick in her life, and it's about every five years, and it's been like, on death's door type of sickness. And then she doesn't get colds or anything like that. She has so much energy, she's always going, 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 but she doesn't take care of herself. And so about every five years, her body says, hey, it's time, it's time, whether you want it or not, we are gonna rest now. So the other thing, it's similar to what Justin was saying about ones. So ones are really looking to improve. Well, does everybody wanna be improved? Probably not. Twos are really looking to help. Does everybody want their help? Probably not. Probably not. Twos have forgotten that they're lovable. That's what they have forgotten. And they're like the most lovely people. So there's a great irony there again. Okay, type three. Threes are the stars in our world. Very comfortable in front of a group, uh, performing, whether, whether that looks like acting or just doing whatever their career is very, very well, whether it's being an at-home parent, they're gonna be the best at-home parent. I was once in an Enneagram class in California with a woman who was a three, um, and she said, okay, so everybody's been telling me for years I should take meditation class, because I'm always so wound up about everything, so I'm taking a meditation class and I am gonna be the best meditator <laughs> in the whole class. And that was such a three thing to say, I mean, it's hilarious. What does that even mean, to be the best meditator, right? But threes are very, very focused on achieving their accomplishments, being successful. Um, and they're highly regarded in our society because most people think that the U.S. is a three society. We're very focused on um, achieving, getting to that next level. Uh, what do you do, right? When we meet each other, that's the first thing we ask. Well, what do you do? And threes are all about doing. What's wrong with that? How could that go wrong? Narcissism. Narcissism, yes. Threes are very focused on their image. And they're om it's almost like they're following themselves around with a video camera, watching themselves in a movie. It's very interesting. It's a very interesting. They're, they're almost like disengaged from who they actually are. What's wrong with doing too much? I mean, things have to get done, right? Could be a lack of focus, yeah. And taking time to do things that are mundane. Yeah, or just, what about just being? What if we were just being? What would that look like? What if we meditated? Just to be, yeah. And that's a challenge for threes. Threes have forgotten that they are capable. Okay, it's another thing that's just funny. If you think about, like, if you know threes and think about them, They're, they are the most efficient, the most just getting stuff done, checking everything off the list, going, going, going. Um, and it's all because they have forgotten deep down that they really are capable, just because of who they are, just for existing. They describe it as smell of roses syndrome. It shouldn't be in your, you shouldn't be living your life just to make money. You should be, yeah. you should be living your life to make memories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very easy for a three to be a workaholic. Other types can be workaholics as well. What's that? Does it transition to four? I'm not sure what you mean. Oh, because you have the cards? Nobody else has the cards. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> maybe that's not fair. Yeah, and so it's interesting because in uh, workshops, Enneagram workshops, or a lot of self-awareness type workshops, you typically don't get a lot of threes unless they've had some type of crisis. 
you know, they've worked themselves almost to death or they've had some type of breakdown, whatever that looks like, maybe in a relationship. Um, and it's been like this game changer for them where they're like, whoa, okay, I need to figure out what, what is the deal? What is the deal? And who am I really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Could be, and that's part of the culture. There's this cultural overlay and where we feel like we have to be three-ish. You, you were totally right. That we are yeah. Three nation. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks we're yeah. Are you familiar with the Enneagram? Did you raise your hand when I asked, uh, Michael? No, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm familiar. I'm aware of it. Yeah. I'm, uh, I've been more of a strength finder. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that. Okay. So fours. Fours are people in the world who really notice the beauty, just naturally. You know, like a three, or a four, rather, might come into this room and just be like, oh, the ceiling, wow. You know, that view, these lovely old windows, you know, they're so charming. Fours just naturally notice those kinds of things. They love symbolism. Uh, one of my favorite stories about a four is uh, a client that I worked with a couple of years ago who was an executive in a healthcare system, he had bought a shovel one weekend, you know, had gone to Home Depot, he needed a new shovel, he bought one, and then he found out later that day that his son, who had just moved to Boston, signed a lease for a loft that was being built in a former shovel factory. And the fact that he had bought a shovel and his son was moving into a shovel factory totally blew his mind, <laughs> totally. And he was telling everybody, he had this big, great story about it. And he just found so much joy in that, like they had this connection. Well, I think that's just so forish because a lot of people might not even, they might be hearing this story from their son, they might have not even realized they bought a shovel that morning, you know, or think anything of it. But his point was, how often do you actually buy a shovel? I mean, not very. I'm still on my first one and I'm 43, right? They last a long time. So fours just see that and they love to like, chew those stories up in the symbolism and just get a lot out of it. One thing that I love about fours, my mom is a four, and I use this to my advantage, is she is, and fours tend to be, comfortable with the full range of emotions. So if you are feeling down and you don't want to be cheered up, because that can be annoying, right? If someone's just like, oh, Gary, it'll be fine, you're going to be fine, don't worry. <laughs> If you want someone to actually like sit there with you in that sadness or whatever it is that you're down about, a four can do that. They're not scared of that. They're not scared to go there with you. I have a teenage daughter and I send her to my mom at times when it's just something I can't do for her. I'll send her to grand nan. All right, so how could this go wrong? These are wonderful qualities about a four, but how might they be overused? Get them into trouble. Yeah, no, no, fours can be very successful at business because they, uh, fours tend to be very creative, very creative, and so that can make them very successful in business. So not exactly. Think ab about, go down the road of the emotions, being comfortable with those emotions. Could you overdo that? Yeah, yeah, Barbara. Overpassionate, yeah. Yeah, they might be dramatic, overly dramatic. Other people, you know, a, a four might still be like, oh, I can't believe that happened. All those years ago, we had this thing happen. Remember that person said that? And the rest of the team is like, hey, you gotta move on. <laughs> what are you even talking about? Like, it's time to move on. Fours are quite nostalgic, so they can get stuck. They can get stuck um, in the past, and they can get stuck in the drama. Because there's just so much richness there. Um, my mom is a spiritual director. She knows I talk about her in any, I have her permission. Um, but she's a spiritual director and um, I was doing some one-on-one -on -one work with some clients at a time and we were talk, comparing kind of notes about working with people one-on-one -on -one. and she said, don't you just love it when they cry? And I was like, no, it actually makes me kind of uncomfortable. And she's like, oh, I just feel like 
when somebody's crying, like then we're really getting to something good. There's richness there. <laughs> that is a four. That is a four. Um, fours have forgotten that they belong. And so they are searching for being seen as the unique special person they are and finding belonging within that. Okay, so fives. Fives are people in the world who are real experts. They love knowledge. They love information. Cannot get enough. I'm going to start speeding us up here because I just looked at the time. So what could be wrong with that? Quest for knowledge. It's awesome. You need information, right? But how could that, how could that go wrong? Hmm? There's people in the world, and you should consider them. People in the world, yeah. It's not just about facts and information, yeah. And really screw up your communication with other people. Ah, how so? Tell me a little bit more. I asked you for the time, and you told me how to build a watch. Yes, that is a great example. That's a great example. That person was probably a five. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes fives get stuck in the accumulating of the information or the doing the research and not actually taking the step of taking some action. Or, or uh, answering a question that gives you way more information than, than they did. When someone has a business question yeah. or a tax question, my answer is the same. It depends. Then I go into a 12 hour seminar. Right, right. <laughs> so fives have forgotten that they are enough so that. Accumulating of information is to help them feel filled up. Sixes are people in the world who are really excellent problem solvers. They can predict all the possible ways that something could go wrong and prepare for it. How might that go wrong? What could be wrong with that? Yeah, I mean, sometimes things go really well. Yeah. Um, and it can cause a lot of anxiety and worry. Yeah. But sixes don't, sometimes they get a bad rap, I think, in the Enneagram world because they're portrayed as worriers. Um, sixes usually don't seem very nervous because they're prepared. They're prepared. So, for example, um, coming into maybe a new scenario like this, a six might think, Okay, they might notice like where the doors are and the windows in case something happens should they need to exit the room if there's some type of emergency. And it's not that they're going to sit here and be like looking over their shoulder all the time because they know where the doors and the windows are. They know what they would do should they need to. So that's a six. Sixes have, what they have forgotten uh, is that the world is a safe place, that they are safe. Seven is the most optimistic type on the Enneagram. So we've got this cute little guy sitting, standing on the beach. Sevens have just a very sunny, positive outlook. They're a lot of fun. They'll be your friend who calls up and says, you know, I was just realizing I've never gone to a rodeo before, and there's one in town, and I think we should go tonight. Okay, so tend to be spontaneous. Um, a, just a lot of fun to be around. So fun is great. Right? How could being too fun get you into trouble? Exhausting. It can be exhausting for people around you and for the seven themselves. Yeah, yep. And it might, um, to your point earlier, Chum, it might uh, impact your ability to focus. Because sevens are always looking at all the options. They're like the FOMO type, the fear of missing out. They just want to do it all. They want to do it all and not miss a thing. What sevens have forgotten um, is that they are free. So they're always trying to prove to themselves that they have freedom. Now, eights, eight is the strongest type on the Enneagram. Very powerful and very aware of their power. They're a very dominant type. They will command a room without even saying anything because they have such an immense amount of energy. And one thing I love about eights is that they're very direct and they're not afraid of a fight. So if they disagree with you about something, you will know it. So that sounds good. Unless you're the one they're disagreeing with, maybe. Yeah. yeah. How could that be overused? We're in Minnesota. That's not <laughs> as professional or nice or anything. People are down themselves. Yeah. Sometimes we could use it, though. I'm but you're right. It can get you into trouble. Like, uh, if an eight hasn't had an argument or a conflict in a while, they might actually go stir one up because it really fuels them. Like, they get a charge off of it. Yeah. 
Eights have forgotten that it's safe to be vulnerable. So they have this, this uh, power that they exhibit because they have forgotten that they could actually be taken care of. All right, and the last type we're gonna talk about is nine. Nine is called the crown of the Enneagram because it's located up on the top and because they can see the opinions of everybody else very, very easily. And they're very in tune to other people's agendas. So they're often a peacemaker or a mediator or the one who says, can't we all just get along? Or they might be the one who's, who says in response to the question, you know, well, where do you want to go to eat? Oh, I don't care. Wherever you want to go. And they really mean it. They really mean it. So how could that get you into trouble if you were a nine? It's nice to have peaceful people around. What? People pleaser, yeah. Yeah, they could get walked all over very easily and actually truly might not know what it is that they want. So it's not just a matter of like, well, my wants aren't as important as yours. It's like they're buried really, really deep and the nine might not actually know what they are. Um, a nine has forgotten that they matter. Each one of those things that we've forgotten in our types, they're just heartbreakers. I mean, I hate to even say it. There are people out there who have forgotten that they matter. There are people who have forgotten that they're lovable, that they're good, um, because all those things are true just because we exist. But whatever type we are has caused us to forget one of them. So that is the Enneagram in a nutshell. Uh, your takeaway for today, well, it can be whatever, whatever you take away. <laughs> but what I would suggest is just coming back to this idea of the relationship between strengths and weaknesses and play with that a little bit. You know, just start to pay attention. Um, have this conversation with people you really love and trust. Bring that worksheet to the Thanksgiving table. What would happen if each person at your Thanksgiving table answered those questions? Wow, I mean, you'd have, like I haven't even done that with my family. I think I'm gonna do that. I'm realizing right now, we are doing that. You would have a war. Would you have a war? Okay, <laughs> well, we don't want that to happen. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, you're only one of them. It's your default. It's your default, and you are only one. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what I'll do right now is wrap up, because it is 1 o'clock, but I'm going to stick around, and I'm happy to answer questions. And you might be like, okay, that was enough for me, but you might have a million, because there's just a lot to talk about with the Enneagram, and I'm happy to stick around and answer them. But I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks to everybody who shared and participated. Uh, and I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you, Kate. Um, You're welcome. Ha happy Thanksgiving to everyone, and we'll see you in, in three weeks, December 13th.